How are you guys? Let's see if we can make this uh, slide different. There we go. So we don't a solo layout. Maybe we'll switch between the two. Got some people online. See some people online who are about to start in a minute. Um, just click like if you can hear me. Uh, click like or post a comment if you can hear me. Just want to make sure that I'm not going to be talking to myself. Hello, Zanile Kumalo, can you hear me? Welcome. Okay, it's two o'clock and uh, I am ready to rumble. Let us do this, okay. Um, I want to switch this around. Okay, okay. how are you guys doing? My name is uh, Carl Joshua Nube, stand-up comedian, uh, celebrity chef, uh, tech entrepreneur CEO of a company called uh, Ekai. Today we're going to be talking about how to, to um, repackage rural. We want to look at uh, uh, the rural setup, rural Zimbabwe, because we are currently doing a four-year study uh, trying to figure out how to unlock uh, any sort of potential that's there in the rural areas that hasn't been exploited. So we're looking at ways in which we can, can um, we can actually uh, monetize uh, rural living uh, in Zimbabwe. So as I said, um, I am the CEO of a company called Ekaya, and I'll be taking you through uh, a presentation firstly, uh, just to explain to you uh, where we've come from in this particular process. Um, so, uh, let me just get my slides uh, in place here. Okay, so we formed a company called uh, Ekaya. So we're going to deal with the pink elephant in the room for all of my Indemili speaking people out there who are looking at Ekaya being incorrectly spelled uh, without an H. Uh, let me just explain. So we formed a company called Ekaya and the whole idea with Ekaya was that it would be more than just a rural project. It was trying to re-identify uh, our way of, uh, of living. Uh, trying to unlock some of the secrets um, that will help us solve a lot of the problems in the world today. Um, having traveled around the world, um, basically, you know, people would talk about tiny homes, uh, they're talking about living sustainably, talking about water management, uh, talking about growing food organically, growing your own food, uh, talking about subsistence farming. And that all sounded like the solution sounded like a Zimbabwe rural setup. Um, and so what we did is we basically formed this company, Akai, and the idea was to um, sort of decode how we, we got here. So the distortion of the name itself basically shows the kind of problem we're trying to solve. Um, I'll, I'll give an example, uh, is the fact that if you look at our country in Zimbabwe, we have a, um, uh, you know, the, the weird thing is that we used to live in harmony with nature and then we were moved from those particular places and then they reserved places for us like reserves right and uh, you know they told us that oh we couldn't speak our own languages and so they grouped our languages together so they took a lot of different languages and just called that in Bivali, and they took a whole bunch of uh, languages and dialects and just called that shana and they just made us a group of people that were about just two Two languages, but we're now being described as two tribes. Uh, on top of that, we were told that the way that we're dressing was not um, professional, so we needed to dress the way that our colonizers, you know, we were told that our religion was not okay, so we had to follow the religion of our colonizers. In fact, we were told the foods that we were eating uh, were not, in fact, they introduced stuff like maize to us, uh, even though we're eating small grains that were a lot more, um, they're a lot better for our health and so on. And so this distortion that has happened has caused us to look at rural in a different way. I'll um, give an example of a joke that I usually tell that 
uh, you know, people think when they see me, I come from Africa, we, we live in grass huts and we're surrounded by animals and we run towards the sun singing songs like And the reason why I mention this a lot is because I had this perception of rural as being backward, as being about uh, poverty, uh, uh, being about a lack of innovation backward. And so all of this distortion, we then put into our name Ekaya, and Ekaya really embodies that, is the fact that this distortion that has happened, what do we do with it now? Can it be corrected? Or do we move forward with these distortions and figure out a way in which we can still preserve uh, our way of life? And so one of the things that I really believe in is this thing called biomimicry. And what biomimicry does is that it's, it's basically how, you know, in terms of product design, we study the clues of, that nature gives us. And so we use the clues that nature gives us in order to come up with solutions. And so as a result, what we, what I started looking at is, uh, you know, because I come from a nursing background, I you know, studied nursing in the UK before I came back and got into creative. But one of the things that was quite remarkable, and I'm sure all of us can relate to this right now, we're dealing with a pandemic called COVID. And the thing about biomimicry is that at a, it believes that at a small level, the, the singular part of a system uh, operates the same as when it's a whole. So for example, a virus, if you look at a virus, if there's a collection of those particular cells, they act a particular way. But if you look at the virus and it's on, as a singular unit, it also acts the, the, the same way. The same way that if you look at a you know, H2O, like a water molecule, on its own, it's water as a group, it's water. And so what, what I started to realize is that a lot of the solutions to our problems start off in the smallest way and not in a big way. So sometimes we try to think of big plans and we don't realize that the big plans usually start with little steps. And so I'm gonna be taking you through the little steps of our approach uh, to looking at rural Zimbabwe before we start redesigning or th rethinking or looking at how to repackage it. And um, so the first step was how could, how, how could I internalize the whole idea of living rural? Like could I live rural? Could I thrive rural? And the only way to do this was to actually move to the rural areas. And so my wife and I moved to the rural areas and the idea was for us to live there so that we can understand the lifestyle that's there look at the contrast between some of the things that we aspire to do and the things that we do that maybe may not be considered rural and the people that live in the rural areas and try to see somewhere in between what it all means uh, before we start actually going towards trying to solve the problem. The next step was to try and find a positive outlook in terms of how do we deal with things in Zimbabwe. So. I came up with this acronym called HELP Zimbabwe and uh, HELP basically uh, broken up, uh, the H stands for sort of our hopes and desires, uh, E is about engagement, uh, L is about listening, and P is about being proactive. And so this would allow us to be able to figure out how could we interface with corporate, with government, with with the public, with uh, local authorities, whatever, by using this particular acronym, this would be our approach to be able to look at what are our hopes and desires as a country or just as a person, and then how and who do I engage with? What ministries are involved in a particular area? What companies are involved in there? And, and really listen, really take the time to pay attention to really what's going on within our rural setup, listen to what people are saying, and just try and take that information to try and figure out exactly how we can be proactive and try and uh, solve these problems. Because we all have Zimbabwe at heart, to be honest with you, and we all want to have an amazing country, but the issue really is that when we figure out exactly how we're going to approach this rural thing, um, you know, it, it basically, we, this, this acronym sort of helped us uh, deal with that. So what, what was our first sort of observation within the six, seven months that we've been living in, in rural? I think the first thing that we wanted to do was to establish our home as what we call a rich center. Again, sorry, with the acronym. So a rich center would be a place where we could do research, we could innovate, we could look at the culture 
and heritage, so R-I-C-H. So the, uh, for us, we looked at our home as a rich center. What does a rich center look like? Because we wanted, we wanted affluence within the rural setup, and how can you do that? And, and the way that we looked at it was that if we came up with an acronym that would help us, at least motivate us to say, okay, we're a rich center, we, we thoroughly want to research what we're doing, we want to innovate, and we want to look at our culture, and we want to preserve our, our heritage. And so, you know, in terms of our desire, this is, you know, um, you know, a lot of you have seen this plan for this house that we've been wanting to, to build, which is what our dream home uh, would, would be, uh, which is supposed to be this eco-friendly uh, home. This is just a skeleton of, of the house, but I'll, we'll explain in future lectures exactly how we're going to be going about this. So, in terms of our approach, one of the things is that we looked at problem solving as like a jigsaw puzzle. So here we're talking about how are we going to package Zimbabwe rural, repackage it. And every time you have to remember that every single idea has a certain level of consequences. So firstly, we look at this jigsaw puzzle and said, how are we going to critique the, the problem? Like, what do we want? What do we want to create? What do we want out of this? And then we then curate. So the curation has to do with what do we know? What can we collect in terms of the information? What do we know? What's out there? What has been researched? What has been written? Uh, what knowledge base can we actually compile and put together? Then we proceed to creating. What is the solution? Like as an idea, creating is not really coming up with the actual product. But what is the idea? When you think about you want to repackage uh, a, a type of food, you want to repackage tourism, you want to look at investment opportunities, you, know, you, you just come up with, a, with an idea. What if? And today we're going to be talking a, a, a lot about a lot of what ifs, okay? Then you get to the level of saying, how do we go about doing it? Now, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't claim to be a person who knows everything, who, who can do everything. But what I do very well is I know the people that know how to do things very well. And I love to collaborate. And this process of collaboration allows us to actually then create things, prototypes, proof of concepts, get stuff going. If it wasn't for collaborations, I wouldn't be able to achieve half the things I've achieved. And so once you've collaborated with this creation that you, that you have, there's going to be a consequence to it. How is it working? And so once you've figured out how it's, it's working, we then correct, can we do it better? Are there better ways of doing it? There's no perfect product. So the product gets out onto the market. We have to play around with it, see what, figure out what can we do better. And then we go back to the stage again of critiquing, what do we want? And then curating, what do we know? But at each point, they, because it's a jigsaw, you can, you can see how the pieces can sort of fit together. So even when you're at the curate phase, you can still look at the consequences of what's happening while you're curating. Because sometimes knowing information changes you uh, for forever. And so this has resulted in us coming up with a very simple model in which we're going to be operating. And this is how I'm going to be explaining to you exactly what our approach is to, uh, to repackaging rural and Zimbabwe, which is to split it into three main categories, which is curation, collaboration, and creation. So we're going to curate, we're going to collaborate, and we're going to create. So the, in, in certain instances, we're going to just see what's out there. What, what do we know? And then once we figure out who we can work with and we are inviting people to work with us, uh, you know, within, within their various organizations, we're not talking about merging, we're not talking about, but we're talking about smart partnerships to figure out, okay, you're doing this, I have this particular skill, if we merge these particular interests, can we create something of value or create a value chain or a community? And then uh, that last bit to create. So there's some fantasies and ideas that we have that we also want to create. We also want to own some IP. We want to be known and credited for having either invented or innovated or, or come up with, with something as well. The other thing that we also want to do is we want, we want to also align with the thinking of what's happening around the world. So we know that the United Nations and you know com countries have signed these uh, sustainable development goals uh, that they have there. I think there's about 17 of them. So no poverty, no hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, renewable energy, good jobs and economic growth, innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities, 
responsible consumption, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace and justice, uh, partnerships for the goals. Now, the interesting thing about this is that, yes, we can take these uh, sustainable development goals for bit the way they, they are. However, there is a need to decode and put it into a language that can be understood. You don't necessarily have to go after the sustainable development goals and say, oh, we're dealing with no poverty, we're dealing with no hunger, we're dealing with good health. So we decided to look at something for example, like a low-hanging fruit in Zimbabwe, and knowing the sector that I work in, which is tourism, right? So the word tourism was the first thing that we wanted to do, was we wanted to change that into our own language, which is why we put tourism. It's something that we could understand, something we could easily relate to and figure out that this is exactly what it is that could embody our desires in terms of when we're looking at biomimicry. If Zimbabweans are not going to travel around their own country, in, especially in rural, then we can't expect foreigners to come and travel. Uh, so the whole model behind tourism was to create something of our own that speaks to our kind of language of sort of decoding. And, and I, I will go into narrative some at the end, but just to give you a bit of a premise, if you watch a documentary that we did that's called Wild Ride with Carl, you will notice that I went around the country actually uh, interviewing and talking to a number of different people in different settings. And now, when we use the sort of development language of saying sustainability and conservation, human-animal conflict, we forget that in our language, when it comes to conservation, that kind of stuff, these things are not said in those ways. They are spiritual. We need to start decoding. Why do we have Tupo? Why do we, why, why do we speak about uh, about animals, why are we custodians and guardians? Because and because this has always been part of our spiritual makeup. So it's not a thing that we do, it's a thing that we are. Um, you know, we go back to the fact that we didn't have any problems with, uh, with animals uh, dwindling until we remember that we were actually officially very good custodians of the land. We were pastoral nomads who were allowing the, the, the land to heal, were eating small grains, we were engaging in trade, fair trade, actually, with other, uh, you know, with other countries coming in and, you know, coming through our various kingdoms. And we enjoyed a lot of great peace uh, within our time. So tourism is there to kind of create our own sort of language and blueprints. Uh, Particularly, you know, for me, it's also I'm celebrating our local celebrities and, you know, people of influence and trying to, you know, trying to push a particular um, uh, agenda within that, uh, talking about how we can get the locals to realize that they are tourism. What, what you have to remember about tourism is that you, uh, it starts at a small level. So I, I always say, like, I am a tourist attraction myself. As Carl Joshua Nube, I'm a tourist attraction. Why? Because... I am interesting. I'm doing something that is interesting. And so people want to come to me because I'm a person of interest. So anything can become a tourist attraction. So wherever it is that I've moved, people have normally followed because they're interested in the thing that I'm doing. Now, take it on a level of a community. If your community is doing something interesting, then people are going to be interested in coming to visit you. So it could be anything. You could decide that you are wearing, all of you are going to be wearing the same type of outfit or all of you do a particular ritual at 3 p.m. or all of you go look at a particular stone which has a significance to your particular tribe. It doesn't matter. As long as it is interesting, people are going to be interested in coming to, to see you. So with tourism, this is a platform in which we're going to be lobbying a lot uh, for tourism to be put onto various channels. Uh, we, we tried running a Tourism Thursdays on ZBC. So what we did is we created uh, videos already from the market and, and we put them into a compilation which was then played on ZBC as promos every Thursday in a way to try and, try and kickstart this whole drive of domestic tourism. Obviously, we have challenges with COVID and so on. That's not to say that the idea doesn't work. It's something that can be done, especially when the markets open up or we decide to be a sort of insular uh, sort of country, then the future of tourism actually does lie in rural because most of us actually do travel to the rural areas. We're just not traveling to each other's rural areas enough. And I think that's where there's a big uh, opportunity. 
The next opportunity is looking at repackaging the food. How do we come up with the recipes uh, or come up with a way in which people can generate uh, recipes? Now, just a snap survey of talking to a number of women within our village in Victoria Falls is that they don't look at themselves as what they do as recipes. They don't think it's something worth writing and they don't think it's something worth sort of passing on, so to, so to speak. How do you teach people at the basic level that what you're doing is valid? And so I've come up with these six T's that allow people to be able to generate recipes actually on the fly and to get us to actually kickstart this whole idea of people uh, cooking a lot more, especially with local ingredients. And it's to look at balancing when you're making a meal, is to look at it from the perspective of what kind of taste are you trying to create? What kind of texture are you, are you looking at uh, going for? What is the temperature that you're going to be cooking it at? How much time is going to be used? And also, what kind of theater are you going to bring to this uh, uh, food, which is exactly how it's going to be presented. And that's a very important thing because we do eat with our eyes. You know, the first thing is that when we see food, uh, we were then stimulated to, 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 to think of it in a different way because of how it's been uh, presented uh, to us. And I have been enjoying uh, this process of cooking in the village and just looking at local ingredients and trying to work with a lot of the other villagers who are growing food and, you know, um, and growing our own food as well. And what we're hoping to do is that this taste technique, texture, time, temperature and theatre is going to be compiled into a book that's going to be put into the curriculum in the schools. It's going to be uh, available for chefs, for restaurants and so on. We hope that this book becomes a staple. And so for the next, the next sort of uh, four year period, we're going to be looking at food from that uh, perspective. And so how are we going to be, um, how are we going to be going about this? Is that we're just going to be traveling around the country, um, uh, engaging in a lot of dialogue with people. We've opened up WhatsApp groups. We're, we're trying to uh, exhaust technology as much as we can before we actually start physically hitting the road. The more we're talking to people, the more questions are being asked. And it's, it's such an amazing and fulfilling process uh, uh, so far uh, in terms of the stuff that we've done. We're also looking at uh, things from a tech perspective. And it's to, it's to look at where did we come from as a people? You know, we were nomads, so we used to travel. We used to travel and go from one piece of land to, to another. So how do we utilize like current technology and the things that we have uh, uh, available? So we're looking at this nomad co uh, concept of having container farms, like the ability for me to be able to go into a particular area and literally just pull out all of my kit from a truck uh, or a number of trucks and be able to stay in a place for about six months to a year, grow some food, and then actually lift off and, and move from that piece of land, allowing it to, to heal some of that bio waste and whatever it is used to regenerate the land. We're trying to introduce this nomad concept to be put in non-arable sort of land or areas where you can't actually grow uh, areas that are a lot more hostile. So we're going to talk about uh, the seeking of partnerships and funding and that kind of thing. Uh, but that's uh, one, one uh, concept. The second concept is we're looking at packaging things that are already in existence. So stuff that we, we, we see in terms of, uh, we have a number of friends who are farmers and we're always talking about waste management, how can we utilize products and make sure that they've got longevity and, and so on. So, you know, things like, you know, uh, trying to come up with a brand of crisps, uh, crisps, so to speak, with a peanut, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, whether you're, you're looking at sweet potato or you're going to be looking at kale chips, any, anything that can be made into chips. Uh, is basically trying to come up with the recipes and the packaging to actually go with it so that it can be introduced to a new type of clientele or, or market. We're actually looking at the seasonings as well. So there's a, a thing that I like to do. I, I like to season my fish with uh, capenta. Um, so what I do is I grind my capenta and I put salt into, into it and then I use it to season my fish. So that can be available as a type of seasoning, which means the capenta can actually stretch or can be introduced to newer markets. People may not want to eat the small fish on its own, but will not have any problems using it as a seasoning. 
uh, as, a, as a flavor or using the wild bush uh, uh, basil or uh, things like um, madura to actually grind them again mix them with salt and then they can be used in, in stews so it's, it's trying to look at how to, to package stuff like our grains how can we also repurpose the containers that are actually used because you see a lot of these containers are, are huge currency in the rural setup you know people love these containers that could be used as like buckets or whatever it is for collecting water or storing things so again also trying to repackage our stuff so that the, the packaging itself can be used uh, for for other purposes uh, one typical example is egg crates uh, like for example do you know that with egg crates can be used as a seedling trays so if we make our egg, egg crates and then convert them into seedling trays uh, and put some messaging inside the crate so that people are actually encouraged to try and grow their own food. They can then use the eggshells in case they're growing tomatoes because that calcium is going to be great uh, when you break up the eggshells and you put them into the egg crate. Uh, apparently, it's good for the tomatoes. And then you can put it into the ground, and then that you know that will <laughs> basically just decompose, and everyone is is going to be happy. Other things that we're talking about is just repackaging stuff. Like so, all of the waste stuff can be used to make sausages. Uh, you know, uh, when I say waste stuff, I'm talking about like some of these cuts of meat that are not so popular can then be used to make sausages and smoked and so on. And the same containers and pannets can then also be used as seedling trays, uh, especially if you are uh, doing a nursery, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, so stuff like your salads and so on, uh, trying to package those. Uh, say for the picnic markets, the Airbnb markets, uh, we live in Victoria Falls, so that's one example. And also trying to look at how we can look at the local brews, things like the kachasus and so on, that they can be made within a legal uh, way. Because remember that in Brazil, there is a drink that's called cachaça. And that is as a result of that trade route coming from Zimbabwe, going out, uh, out to uh, South America from the coast on the... Uh, would I call it the western side of the of the continent? So again, if you look, we've criminalized a lot of things that we could have commercialized, and so we need to rethink how we look at our, our local uh, uh, products. I was going to go into him, but I think that's a discussion for another day. The other thing that we also creating is going to be a online shop. Now, the way that the sh the shop or the online store is going to start is the fact that we have started just curating. We just want to know all the products that are being used in rural Zimbabwe and just put them on a website and backlink them to the suppliers. So if they're using mealy meal, what type of mealy meal are they using? What's the most common uh, type of, uh, you know, what are the what are the products that are, that are there? Where are people getting their chickens? Where do they get their goats? Where do they get their donkeys? Anything, like whatever product is being used in rural Zimbabwe, we want to know about it. We want to put it onto a website and want to link it to a supplier. Because we want, people want to know exactly what it is that's actually selling, what products are, are successful from a rural perspective. The reason why we want to do this is because sooner or later, we're going to get to a point where we start compiling uh, a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of um, almost combination of products. And I'll give a, a typical example. I'm a brand ambassador for send it to. So we're very excited because send it to as a store. And the online store now allows us to start thinking of the future of where Send It To is going to come. Because, for example, there's been a big complaint that people want to invest in the rural areas, but they keep throwing money down the tree because, you know, they can't find someone they can trust or, or so on. Now, imagine if there was an online store and on there you've got an actual set of products that has been curated for you. Like if you want to start a chicken project, uh, stuff that you can buy for $100, for $200, $500, for $1,000, projects you can start investing in and the products are already available. Those things can be fulfilled in terms of delivery to the particular location. And then you can then deal with the labor issues and so on to get the, the products uh, actually assembled and, and so on. And so it would be an easier way for you to be able to invest back in rural without actually feeling like maybe you're sending money and then, you know, you know the correct things are not being bought and so on. So we're going to start curating this information and using this as a research platform to be able to figure out what it is that's being sold or bought. We're also going to be looking at setting up a market. And so with the market, it's almost like a French, a lot of these ideas that we're talking about here, and the reason why I'm sharing them with you is because 
they are franchised sort of uh, concepts. So you speak to us and then we will help you to set it up within your own communities, whichever way that you're, you're going about it. Different business models are available that we can look at in order to make that happen. So one of the things that we're trying to set up is a market where basically we're just curating what's happening in our village. We're putting it onto a WhatsApp platform and sending it out. A typical example is like there's a lady who does vegetables and already there's a supermarket interested in buying her vegetables. Because of the links that we have, we can just send the information with the right kind of, uh, with the right kind of language. Remember, it's all about language. You find the, the right language to, 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 to give to the supermarkets and you link them with the right people who are growing the stuff. Because some fantastic stuff is actually being grown in the village. But on top of the, the WhatsApp, what we're doing is we're trying to create a community where monthly, as a tourist attraction, we will actually showcase what it is that we grow in the village so people can actually come from outside to see at the market. So there'll be football being played, there'll be a lot of stuff that's actually going on while people are actually selling the stuff. We want to make our economies trade again. Remember, they used to trade in the past. People knew that uh, they would go to the Mutaba Kingdom because they knew that they, 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 could, they could buy and sell and exchange stuff. So it's also a lot of things that we're trying to introduce as some kind of, not an exchange rate, but trying to understand how, how to articulate the butter trade system. For example, I've sold a number of things in the village in exchange for things like chickens. And for example, so one of my neighbors bought stuff for six, uh, and they gave me six chickens. And those six chickens have multiplied to 12. And this is not the kind of interest rate you can get at the bank, if you, if you think about it. Because now I sold something that was the value of six chickens, right? So six chickens at maybe $5 per chicken, that's $30. Now $30 is then translated into six more chickens, which gives me another $30. That's like 100% uh, interest. And, then, and, and I'm talking about this like at the end of, say, eight, an eight-week uh, period when the chickens might be uh, ready to slaughter or, or, or sell. The other thing that we're looking at in terms of, uh, and that we're excited about, is our rural BNB. Our rural BNB basically is a uh, platform where we, uh, we identify, the other thing that we're looking at, we identify a rural homestead, right? Your rural homestead. And basically, we look at a number of things that you can add into that rural homestead so that you, we can put you onto our website, uh, which will also operate an, an app. So people will be able to book uh, and come and stay at your particular premises. Now, depending on how you've set it up, you would have a different sort of scoring. People have different needs in terms of the tourists. We just help you in terms of figuring out exactly how you're going to deliver that to the, the, the customer. So you might just be offering a rural homestead with nothing else. So what we're just going to put on the website is that you're offering a rural homestead and nothing else. Uh, there are going to be verified uh, hosts. There's going to be almost super hosts, the same way that your Airbnb concept works, except this is going to be specialized specifically uh, in rural homesteads because we're looking not only at Zimbabwe, but we're looking from an African perspective. How can we start hosting people in our homes? Uh, because we have a lot that we can offer uh, in there, uh, particularly in terms of our story. And this is the last thing that I was just going to talk about, is that story is everything. Um, being able to tell the right story to the rest of the world, decoding that local language and sending it out to the rest of the world to say, hey, we're also here, we're proud of what we do, this stuff tastes nice. These stories are very interesting. This is very funny. This is very entertaining. And so how are we going to go about this? Now, um, using this beast here, we're going to be going around the country. Uh, by beast, I mean the vehicle, not the guy in front of the vehicle with the white glasses. But what I mean is we're going to take this beast around the country. And the idea is just for us to be able to document and create content. Uh, but what kind of content are we trying to create? Now, we're, we're now targeting, we're now targeting, we're now like now wanting to get into the business of things. We want to be on the Netflix. We want to be on Facebook Watch. We want to be on DSTV, like hit Fox, Sky. All of the markets that, from a tourism perspective, are interested in what we're doing. We want ZBC because we want the, we want the locals to actually understand 
and join this particular revolution of of being more proud of your uh, of your heritage in terms of uh, Zimbabwe. We want to be on the on on the YouTube. We want to go and literally paint the country, so to speak. And um, you know, one of the ideas is just going around. I'm just giving you an example of some of the content. Uh, just going around and actually doing uh, makeover shows. Uh, so uh, trying to come up with a line-based paint um, so that people, we can go and paint and beautify people's homes as a television show, uh, people that were trying to upgrade their rural BMVs uh, as we're traveling around the country. If we call in partners, like I said, it's what ifs. What if Nash Paints came on board and said, ah, Carl, we're willing to produce a line-based paint for you guys. Uh, and you guys, we can do a TV show and we can change the, the the look of our of our rural areas just make it more colorful just make people more excited and proud of what they're they're actually doing why not it could it could happen what if each of the colors was linked to the un's sustainable development goals so like you're using sustainable sustainable development goals that are actually on the uh, the paint cap because the reason why i'm targeting this paint cap is because these, these, these buckets are currency in rural areas. They're used for a lot of things, for watering the garden, for planting. They have a use beyond after the, 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 the paint. So that's why I've actually targeted that. The second thing is actually looking at uh, creating uh, games. So like here, we've created an actual board game that's called our African Village. Um, this is a follow on to the game that we created called the Game Track. But our African Village basically is a game that's uh, it's a strategy game. But it's a game that's full of compromises. You are given a particular territory, and you have to make certain decisions based on uh, some challenges that you're given uh, on the board. It's such a great game for family to to play, and I'm really excited about creating the the prototype uh, on there. We also want to create uh, Chief Chief. Chief Chief is the story of a uh, a chief that wanted everything, wanted to absorb all of the totems of his enemy so that he become more and more powerful. And uh, so he ends up losing his, his totem. So the premise is what will a man do to get back a lost, a lost totem? Uh, basically, it's going to be a movie, a graphic novel, a series, a game, and also a village amusement ride. So something that can exist from a village perspective where people can reenact what we're going to be creating in this particular um, uh, story. So uh, I'm talking about in terms of free packaging, uh, rural. Uh, the, the series of lectures is actually also going to be looking at things like letting you know exactly how it is that you can reconnect with your own rural areas, how to get uh, land going and speaking to your sub um, uh, coming up with project proposals that are going to benefit the community. Because remember, this is a community thing. Uh, this is communal land that we're talking about. So you all, always have to have a heart for the community. There has to be a benefit to, uh, to the community uh, itself. So there'll be a number of lectures that we're going to go into and we're going to expand on this. It's a four year period, guys. So it's a lot you're going to learn. We're going to learn from each other. At this particular point, I just wanted to thank the, um, a couple of our partners um, that we've been working on uh, so far. Firstly, I want to mention the Ministry of Information, Communication, Technology, Postal and Courier Services, uh, who have just generally been very supportive in terms of just lending us an, an ear and saying to us some of the initiatives that they're working on so that we know how to align ourselves. And remember, we're talking about the Help Zimbabwe. I want to thank Cindy too, uh, again, who have allowed us to continue working, especially within this uh, COVID uh, era. We're still able to be able to pay uh, salaries and so on and keep the, the project going. We've got two young boys who are in our mentorship who are paid for money that we received from Cindy too. So that's uh, pretty fantastic. Uh, we thank them for that. Uh, Christos Braveview, just want to thank Christos Braveview. Um, this is where I'm recording this from. This is where we work from when we come into town to use the internet. Um, so I want to thank the team at Cresta, um, you know, their meals and whatever, they're pretty uh, fantastic. Uh, Likarama, I want to thank them again, large selection of their liquor uh, for our sundowners and so on. It's always very really good to be able to relax. Uh, Mr. Source has also uh, supplied a lot of uh, condiments and so on from their range. Um, for the stuff that I, I cook. Uh, ZBC have been great in terms of uh, posting our content. So they take the stuff that we have on our YouTube and they play it on uh, television, which is uh, absolutely fantastic. I want to thank the TED community who are always uh, there as a sounding board. What's lovely about TED is that I have access to all these engineers, doctors, 
all these brains and they're just so helpful you know you ask a question listen we're struggling with this and then they'll point you in the right direction of some initiatives that are already there we're not trying to reinvent the wheel so we just want to make sure that we're doing things um you know um, that are going to benefit our communities uh, masters uh, were very fantastic bringing us some input uh, tools and a lot of uh, stuff that we used to build the bus the bus was the basis for all of this when the bus that we converted and I, i'd encourage you to look for a little bus project so you can see how we converted it into a home this was done to try and help people to figure out how they can integrate into rural it's great to actually convert a broken down bus put it on a piece of rural land so that you can build the stuff that you're doing it puts you under less pressure and that was very helpful fresh in a box uh, super awesome to have other people within this tech space who are innovating all the time you know you wake up and fresh in a box are doing something pretty cool and amazing um, and you know Kuda and his team are, are super incredible just keeping us encouraged uh, you know um, and also their product uh, as well which is absolutely fantastic i just enjoy cooking with their fresh uh, produce uh, love for africa is super awesome they've been very supportive and they are going to be supportive in terms of allowing us to get around the country in one of their vehicles so we're going to be yeah yeah, that's going to be totally cool. Uh, Southern African Times have provided a uh, platform for us to be able to host all of this content. So these lectures, the articles that I'm going to be writing, any presentations that I'm doing, opinion pieces are going to be published uh, on a website that I'm going to give you just now. Uh, Hamara uh, uh, Foods, they have been fantastic because they are, are actually taking the time out as a company to teach me how to be a farmer. You see, the thing is, I'm not a farmer. I don't have a farming background. And so Hamara are trying to teach me so that I can also be a vehicle to encouraging people to grow their own food, uh, to, to be able to rear chickens and so on, and you know, uh, you know how to, to grow vegetables and, and that kind of thing, and to create a profitable uh, business uh, from it. Uh, as I said, Southern African Times have created a website for us, which is ekaya.thesouthernafricantimes.com. So if you go on there right now, you'll be able to view uh, things as I'm posting, as you know, as we come across some information, we we'll post it on there. That's where the the, the shop is going to be um, uh, on that particular platform, and a lot of our uh, articles. You can also join our WhatsApp uh, group. Uh, I'll put a um, a link in the in the comments so that you can join uh, the group. Um, we already have one group that is filled up, and it's filling up the second group at, at the moment. And it's just really great just seeing people bounce off uh, ideas and just share their, their experiences. I think um, that's been one of the most awesome things, to, um, uh, to, to, to be honest with you, um, is just hearing people's uh, opinions and um, uh, what they're working on and what their aspirations are, what their challenges are. Uh, that's been pretty amazing. And I also want to thank uh, Zimbo Ties uh, for their fantastic uh, bow tie. I think I'm trying to introduce this as a dress code in the village uh, because my grandfather was a smart uh, villager. He always said, you never know when you'll get a call. Pomonosha is going to president. So you just need to be red at all times. So I always want to be red. I can put my overalls over this and... Uh, and continue doing my work. Anyway, guys, I am um, super excited uh, to be given the opportunity to speak to you guys. Uh, please join our WhatsApp group. We're now going to be having a discussion uh, from now on within the WhatsApp group. Um, so please chime in. I think I'll give it an hour before um, you know I sort of joining in the discussions. And the presentation that I've been given is going to be available in the group uh, as well. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, you guys have been uh, super awesome with your support so far, your encouragement so far. Uh, my name is Carl Joshua Nube and uh, my lovely wife, Nelsie, on the side here. Hey guys. Both, both of us are in school. She's in school. She's studying uh, media and communications. Uh, she's doing a bachelor's degree. I am doing a self degree, a self study, I guess. Uh, so. The, the approach that we're taking, all the projects that you're seeing, it's almost like classwork for me. So I'm just going to be approaching it like we were doing a project at school. And, uh, pre but the projects that we're doing have real life uh, implications. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, you guys have been super awesome. I hope I've addressed some of the questions that you guys have asked prior, but if you have any questions, please type them in the comments and then I'll try and make sure 
uh, that I get an answer to. Thank you. Until the next time.